What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to another video looking at some electronics tips for photographers. And so today I want to talk to you about how to control your camera from a microcontroller using a 4N25 opto isolator and the cable release connection on your camera. Now I had originally planned to include this in the video that I'm working on for how to build a stroboscopic rolling shutter test rig or test light. However, I realized in the process of putting that video together that this is way more broadly applicable, way more useful to far more photographers and might be interested in looking at that. And so I separated it out and that's why we're doing this in this video. So to start with this discussion, we need to start by taking a quick look at the remote release or shutter release, cable release, whatever you want to call it, connector on your camera. Now, pretty much all the camera manufacturers out there have their own proprietary connector that they use for the remote release port on their camera. Canon uses the N3 connector on their higher end cameras and a two and a half millimeter headphone jack style connector on their lower end cameras. However, there's one thing that is the same with all of these connectors and that's fundamentally, regardless of how many pins are in the connector or whatnot, there are only three connections or three cables or wires that are necessary or used by the cable release aspect. So these wires correspond to a shutter full press function, a shutter half press function, and a common ground that the function cables are shorted to in order to trigger that event. And so basically this works the same way as the shutter release does in your camera. In fact, it's generally wired in parallel with the shutter release in your camera. So short one of the function lines to the ground on the cable and the camera performs that action. Now, one thing to know or realize about the separate cable release terminal is that unlike the shutter button where you have to go through the half press position to get to the full press position, that isn't strictly required with the external connection. So if you don't use the half press position in your application, so for example, I do rear button focusing, I don't need a half press position to run the autofocus system, I can skip right past that. I don't need to duplicate the circuit twice for each of the operations operations and I can just have one circuit to control the full press to either release the shutter or start and stop a recording in video. Now the way we interoperate with this or interconnect with this or the easiest way I should say to interconnect with this is to use an adapter cable like one of these. So these were primarily intended or primarily are intended for connecting your camera to a wireless trigger system such as pocket wizards or any of the other variety out there that support remote camera triggering. And so you would have on one end of the cable is your camera's proprietary connection. On the other end of the cable is a three and a half millimeter tip ring shield or mini stereo audio jack for connecting. Now, because these are generally intended for use as a cable release type or an interface to a wireless shutter release, they almost all are wired in the same fashion. So the tip or audio left channel, and I'm including the audio aspect here because some of the stuff that you might want to use in a project uh, is likely going to be intended for audio applications because this is just an audio connector. And so it may be labeled left, right ground as opposed to tip ring shield. So having both of those terms is useful. So as I was saying, the tip or the left audio channel is wired to the shutter full press function wire. The right audio channel or the ring connection is wired to the shutter half press function. And the shield or the audio ground is the common ground that you connect them to. Now, if you happen to have one of these cables and you're not sure of the operation, you can test it yourself using a short piece of wire or some alligator clips or something and simply connect the ground at the shield of the base and then touch the other two connections with your wire and see what the camera does. Bear in mind, this is perfectly safe. The way that a, a shutter release, even an OEM one works is simply by shorting out these two connections. There is no resistors or any other internal circuitry in a shutter release. And even in the event that you say happen to connect the shutter full press to the shutter half press function, both of those are at the same potential. They're not going to be able to, or there no current is going to flow from one to the other. And so it's safe as that as well. Uh, but if you do that, you just won't see any operation or anything happen on the camera. Now, 
For the electrical specifications of all of this, again, this is going to vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. However, the, the overall situation should be fairly similar to what I'm going to describe here, which is what I've measured on Canon cameras. So what I've measured on Canon cameras is that the camera will put a three volt potential difference uh, across the two cables or to the function cable to ground. So the ground is your ground or your negative. The two function cables will have three volts on them uh, positive relative, relative to that ground reference. When you short the two connections, I measured the current flowing through that at 3 milli or 0.3 milliamps or 300 microamps. So it's a very low current uh, operation or very low current is flowing through this. So there's not a whole lot of anything to worry about. And of course, it's all limited in the camera because this is the camera's remote terminal situation. And it again is working simply by shorting these two wires together. Now we do need to know that 3 milliamp or 0.3 milliamp level uh, simply for the calculations when we get into talking about the opto isolator or choosing an opto isolator. Now I am going to talk about the engineering aspects of picking resistors and the opto isolator and so on and so forth. However, the reality is, is that you can just follow along and use what I'm using because I've already done the engineering for that and so have many other people. Uh, and this is a perfectly serviceable solution. So with that said, let's get into talking about the 4N25 opto isolator. So there are many variants of opto isolators out there on the market. They use very different or many different technologies, but in the case of the 4N25, it uses, uh, although I should say all of them work broadly in the same way. But in the case of the 4N25, there is an infrared LED on the controlling side or the input side, and there is an NPN phototransistor on the controlled or output side. Now the LED and phototransistor are electrically isolated from each other so that there's no current or anything flowing between the two sides of the chip. In fact, a, the standard for a 4N25 opto isolator is 2,500 volts of electrical isolation between the two sides. So that's what we are getting, uh, why this is an important task or thing to use. Put simply, when the LED is turned on, the transistor becomes conductive. When the LED is turned off, the transistor is not conductive. So there are a number of things that we need to take into consideration for choosing an opto isolator. The first of those is potentially the how fast the opto isolator can transition from conducting to non-conducting or what its response time is. Now, in the case of this application, we're mimicking a person pushing the shutter button. And that is not fast action, and we're not going to be doing this at any kind of ridiculously high frequency. So there's very little reason to have a very fast switching opto isolator in practice. And the 4N25 switches way faster than any of our applications or in anything than this application requires. So it's perfectly serviceable in that respect. Now, the second, probably more important consideration is what's called the current transfer ratio. And this is the relationship between the current that flows through the LED and therefore how bright the LED is and how much current the transistor can handle or pass. Now, from a design perspective, the two considerations that we're trying to balance here are that the current through the LED must be low enough to not damage our microcontroller's output drivers. Uh, we don't really, I mean, there's ways to get around that, but we don't really want to have to introduce multiple transistors and more complexity to this if we can avoid it. And the current transfer ratio at the LED current or the current safe for our microcontroller has to be high enough for that configuration to be able to trigger the camera. Now, the good news here is that the 4N25 is perfectly fine for this. At reasonable currents from a microcontroller, so about 10 milliamps, it can switch or the transistor side of it can pass about 10 milliamps. And since our camera only requires three tenths of a milliamp, we have basically more than order of magnitude of headroom, or at least more than 10 times as much headroom as the camera needs. So 4N25 is perfectly serviceable for this application.
So now that we've talked about the transistor or what the opto isolator is and the 4N25, let's talk about how to actually hook it up for this, uh, for this system. And we're going to start by looking at the camera side of the implementation or the camera side of the hookup. And the short of it is this is really simple. So we wire the function we want to control, so either the full or half press pin 2, pin 5 on the 4N25. Now if you're looking at the 4N25 such that pin 1, which has also got a small indentation in the package, or a small dot in the package, is in the upper left corner, pin 5 will be the middle of the right side. And we connect that simply to the camera's function that we want to use. Now, for the second hour, the output to complete the circuit, we wire the camera's ground connection to pin 4, which is the emitter pin on the 4N25. So this will be the bottom right pin on the package, again, in that same orientation. And that's it. That's all we have to do. We don't need to have any other components on this side of the circuit. Now, you may find guides online if you do some extra research on this that tell you that you need to use a base pull-down resistor or a base resistor and that you should use something in the, say, 47 kilo-ohm range and that you could connect this between the base pin or pin 6 on the 4N25 package to your camera's ground connection. Uh, this is Technically, well, this won't hurt anything, but it is not, strictly speaking, necessary in my experience for any of this implementation. So I've left it that out on every of this, every circuit that I've built using a 4N25 to control a camera. Now, the input side of this situation is slightly more complicated, uh, but it is just an LED, and it's just the circuit that you are probably familiar with if you've done anything with a microcontroller. It's the first circuit that you usually build with a microcontroller just to make sure that you have everything working. Uh, so it is your typical LED circuit. You come out of a, your digital out on the microcontroller into the LED, out of the LED, through the uh, current limiting resistor to ground. So in this case, instead of a standalone LED, you're just looking at pins 1 and 2 of the 4N25 package. Now, designing this side of the circuit is slightly, but not tremendously, more complex than the camera side, where we didn't have to do anything. There are two pieces of information that we need to know to do this properly. The first is the forward voltage of the LED in the opto isolator. So you'll find this information in the data sheet. Typically, you'll see something somewhere that will say like what the typical voltage or maximum forward voltage is. In the case of the 4N25, the typical forward voltage is 1.3 volts. However, it's an LED. LEDs, like any other diode, have voltages, uh, the forward voltage will vary with the forward current and the temperature of the source. So there will actually be a graph somewhere in the man uh, data sheet for your opto isolator that tells you what the exact numbers are going to be. However, for the purposes of this, I'm just using 1.3 volts because I've built in so much margin in the design that if it's 1.1 volts or 1.2 volts or 1.0 volts, it's not going to make an appreciable difference to the operation of the circuit. The second thing we need to know is the current capabilities or how much current we can source from the digital I.O. pins on our microcontroller. Uh, typically, this is going to be 20 to 50 milliamps, depending on your microcontroller. If I remember correctly, the ESP32s are somewhere between 20 and 28 milliamps. Most Arduinos can handle about 20 milliamps. In some configurations, they can handle more like 40 milliamps. So, I'm going to give you the math here for two different operations and what resistors you need to use or should, should target using. First, we're going to take a look at the case of a 3.3 volt microcontroller. So this would be an ESP32, an Arduino Maker, or any of the Arduino Nano series. And again, we're targeting 10 milliamps because it's basically half of what the current capabilities of these devices are. So if you do the math, that works out to needing a resistor of around 200 ohms. Uh, 200 ohms isn't a standard resistor size, so 220 ohms is a very close standard approximate. 
that will drop the current through this circuit to a little bit. It'll be down to about nine milliamps instead of 10, uh, but we can verify by looking at the current transfer ratio chart on our data sheet that at nine milliamps, the current transfer ratio is pretty close to one. So we can say that the tr uh, transistor side of the 4N25 can pass around nine-ish milliamps, which is vastly greater than the 0 0.3 milliamps that the camera actually needs to pass to switch. And so this is a perfectly workable configuration. Now, your second option is if you're using a five volt microcontroller. So this would be something like an Arduino Uno, Arduino Megas, I think, are also 5 volt, uh, or potentially some of the PIC microcontrollers if you're going really hardcore. And again, targeting 10 milliamps, the math tells us that we need to do or need to use a, approximately a 370 ohm resistor. Now, again, 370 ohms is not a standard size for most tolerance bands. The closest is going to be 390 ohms, and this is going to give us about the same current handling that we had in the 3.3 volt case. It's 9.5 milliamps in this case versus the 9 that we had previously. Uh, so that's all going to play out almost identically. We have two other options that we can use here. We could go up a step to a 470 ohm resistor. That will drop the current through this part of the circuit to 7.8 milliamps. And if we go through the math to see if this also will work as a viable solution, we see that the at 7.8 milliamps, the transistor side would be able to pass around 6 milliamps, which is still much greater than 0 0.3 milliamps. So that's a perfectly workable solution as well. Obviously, less current. It's going to save you a little bit of power. It's going to save some load on your microcontroller. Now, the other option here is you can actually do this with a 220 ohm resistor and you can do it safely. And in fact, my Arduino implementation that I have using this, uh, using the 4N25 to control cameras, I did use 220 ohm resistors and it's perfectly fine. So this will result in about 17 milliamps through passing through the LED circuit. Now the Arduino Uno can handle a 20 milliamp continuous load on its digital outs. The LED in the 4N25 can handle up to 60 milliamps, I believe it is, uh, uh, as a continuous current through the LED. So we're obviously under both of those situations and therefore that's going to be perfectly fine. Uh, however, with resistor tolerances and all of the potential other variations, I probably wouldn't recommend doing this, or I, I wouldn't recommend going this way. I would use a higher value resistor. And in fact, if I rebuilt my circuits on my older board, I would step them up to 390 or 470 ohms just because I like the added headroom and margin that is available when you're not pushing things quite as close to the limits. So the final thing I want to talk about very briefly, I'm not going to go into how to write the software for this, uh, but I do want to talk uh, quickly on some software related notes, specifically timing issues and considerations. So basically in my testing, at least with Canon gear, I have found that you can use a hundred millisecond timing uh, or delay interval on your button presses and the camera will read that perfectly fine and consistently and reliably as a button press or the shutter release press. So you probably can go shorter. I've never bothered trying to get it to go any shorter than that. Uh, longer, of course, is also going to work to a point, but remember, we are talking about something that's inherently designed for a pretty wide tolerance range on uh, triggering events because this is the same part of the camera and the same logic in the camera that's being used to, uh, to handle the shutter release press. And when we press the shutter release or press and release the shutter release, it's not the fastest thing in the world. The second note here is that if you are doing bulb or you are building this to work with your camera in bulb mode, so for example, you're building an intervalometer that does bulb ramping, your bulb, uh, because of the way bulb works, you will need to hold the output state high for the entire duration of that bulb exposure, which has the consequence of going back to that current limiting resistor and making sure you keep your circuit well under the, chemi the continuous operating limits of the microcontroller that you're using. Now, in the case of 
if you're following what I've designed here, the 10-ish or 9 to 10 milliamp current load should be well under uh, the limits of basically most of the most popular microcontrollers. So Arduinos, the Nanos, the Makers, the ESP32s, anything like that, this will all work fine. So with that said, this is how to control your camera with a 4N25 opto isolator and the cable release port from most of the most common microcontrollers. Obviously, software is going to be entirely up to you, and this gets you the door open to go do anything that you find that your flight of fancy that you have. So any kind of thing that you can dream up where you need to turn your camera on or off, this can be used for that. So if you found this useful, or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.